Okay. I'm going to stop sharing mine. I'm going to share my whole screen because things are going to open up left and right. So I apologize if you hear the a good old AOL sound. That's my students. I'm also the type of presenter that I encourage you to unmute and engage in conversation, ask questions as I go. Um, one thing I do have to tell you that's not in my bio is you're looking at someone that just finished six months of chemotherapy for stage 3B colon cancer. So I tell everybody to check their colon no matter where I present. It's sort of like my new like message to everybody because Dana Farber here in Massachusetts and it's 10.05 p.m. here. Um, Dana Farber said that one in four people born after 1974 will be diagnosed with colon cancer and they don't know why. So I really do encourage everybody. I'm a walking example, but we're not here to talk about colons. We are here to talk about building a powerful classroom community one bite at a time. I'm going to be talking about hooking students from day one and then throughout the year, I'm going to be sharing various activities. Everything you see here on this Google site, beg, borrow, steal. That's why we're here, right? To get ideas and make them our own. And I hope that there's something on here that sparks for you. I do have on my site, my contact information, my email and who I am on Twitter. I will get back to you if you have any questions after this or like three weeks from now, you're sitting there going, hey, Ray, and I saw you share this. Like, how did you do this? What happened? Can you help me with this? What do you think? Reach out. All right, here we go. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is I um, getting to know you activity. So one of the things that I do, and can you see everything as the tabs are opening? Okay, perfect. So I actually created this getting to know me activity based on something I saw off of Twitter. It was one of those things where pre pandemic, we did a poster on paper where the kids kind of wrote about themselves. And now that I was starting remote and hybrid, I did um, a Google slide. And the nice thing about Google slides is you can go to file and page setup and change the orientation of it. So I made it like a legal size paper. And what this did was not only teach me what kids liked and didn't like, but I could also see who knew how to use the highlighting tool, who knew how to fill in a text box, who could do a video. I also have at the top, tell me your name and your nickname so I know how to pronounce everyone's names because I really do think that's important. I do have a lot of students who come from various cultures and I cannot pronounce their names on my list. So I wanna know from them how to pronounce it. The other thing I added here, which you might see, I don't know how small it is on your screen, so I just highlighted it with my mouse. I have pronouns you identify with, optional. I have my first transgendered male fifth grade student this year. And by putting that one line on this sheet, spoke to that child immensely knowing that he was in a community that was gonna accept him for him. It opened up an entire conversation about pronouns with my students and what that meant. Yeah, yeah. And it was wonderful. So just a great way to really engage and include students. I also asked them to tell me a joke. So we get to see their sense of humor. And if they can't find one, I tell them to Google one. I get to understand them and I, I get to know what they want in a teacher. So any questions about this? And feel free to make a copy and take it and do your, do your own thing with it. The other activity we do is um, goal setting. So I teach them about Twitter, right? This totally ties with the keynote and the internet in 60 seconds. So I want my students to understand that I have a Twitter account, that they're allowed to tweet through me, what Twitter brings to them using hashtags and at symbols and what Twitter, how they can use Twitter to reach out to the world. So we talk about what is a goal, why do people set them and how do you know when you've reached them? I don't know if any of you are a brain pop school, but if you are, there's a great video on brain pop about setting goals. So we do some activities in brain pop with the goal setting. Then I have asked the students to reflect on how it went. Then I ask them, if we talk about what kind of goals you can have for the school year. And they think of one goal. And then we talk about Twitter, what it is. And I ask them to compose a goal in 240 characters. Now they think that means 240 words. So then we have to talk about characters and what that means. We talk about the at symbol and we talk about hashtags. 
And then I actually have the students compose a tweet and I put in a link to a character count website that counts the characters as they go. You can also teach them to highlight and go into the tools right in Google, but this was just easier. My kids are 10. So I got to see them copy and paste into this box. And then I asked them this question, would you like me to share your tweet on Twitter? And if they say yes, I tweet it out. My students are secret agents training for the student sector of the FBI. Everyone has an agent number. So their hashtags are their agent numbers. So therefore there's an on, you know, I protect their names, right? So agent one is, is Bihan, but he's hashtag agent one. So his name is never out there in public, but just more of their own hashtag. And what's neat, what the kids have figured out is over the years, if they Google if hashtag agent one, all of the last few years that I've been using Twitter with kids, all the Agent One's tweets come up. So it's kind of neat to see that. So that's how I introduced Twitter. And you can really use tweets for book characters, like what would a book character say? Or in social studies, you know, with some sort of important event or a science concept like the water cycle, we've been tweeting about that. You know, obviously they can tweet to experts and whatnot, and I'll get into that in a little bit, but just you can really use this for all kinds of things. The other thing I have is called Things That Rock, and I use Pear Deck for this, where the kids sort of drag the icons. It's a, a hand up or a thumbs down over what they think about homework, right? So you could do this all throughout the year with what they think about things, you know, what they think about iPads what they think about soccer. I did this with things of the 80s. I had like floppy disks. I had car, uh, the garbage pail kids. If you're a kid of the 80s, I don't know how many people know what those are, but all, um, the original Atari, they were trying to figure out what that was. Um, Ronald Reagan, they had no idea who he was. Just some, it was interesting just to see what they thought. So you can really just keep changing these pictures out to get to know what your students think about these things. And these are all things that I do at the beginning of the year, but can take um, through the end of the year. And then the other thing I put in here, I don't know how many people are familiar with um, Facing History and Ourselves. It is an amazing website with all kinds of things, but I happen to randomly stumble upon these activities for remote and hybrid start. And it's all about identity and building community and who we are. And they have all the activities done with lesson plans and ways you can sort of adapt them in your own classroom. And the mime, we have to do a morning meeting every morning at 8.30. And I was like, what am I going to talk to kids about five mornings a week? And let me tell you, I have filled it up up until about three weeks ago with things from this site. So I really encourage looking at that. This Brave Spaces one about encouraging kids about what a brave space is online, what a brave space is in a classroom, and then what a brave space is in my community was wonderful for them just to be able to encourage them to speak because it's so different now that they're all like you right now, right? And like little things and everybody's muted and nobody speaks and it's not the same as being in a room, but that was really neat to get my kids to realize that, yeah, you're gonna have to unmute yourself and talk. So does anyone have any questions about the getting to know me activities? You sure? I like to ask. All right, so when, my students come into the room pre-pandemic i used to have a slide deck on the board with you know some kind of directions but i had a question of the day and the students would write the answer and like a notebook and then every single kid would check in with me with their answer and it was a great way for me to check in with each child before school started now i have a class size of 22 to 30 kids so it's manageable depending on the year. And it's just a quick check, right? And so what I put in here was the slide deck with, I'll show you what the big ones look like, like a slide deck with all the questions, right? So that way the kids can see these, like, what are your strengths? How can we use those to make our classroom a better place? What does success at the end of the year look like? Um, this slide deck is huge and you're entitled to it. If you could change anything in the world, what would you change and why? So all kinds of questions. Sometimes I would add, like if we were doing an author event, I might ask a question about like, what would you ask this author just so that way they already have something in mind. Or if we do, um, I don't know how many of you do Skype a scientist, but like something about that. So that way the students already have a frame of reference. Well, this one I put up, which I love. I don't know if you've ever seen this image, but it says you have $15 to build the ultimate superhero team. And it has, you know, the 
each of these themes and then the superheroes and how much they're worth. And the kids have to figure out who they'll buy up to $15, but they have to total 15. I mean, look at them. And obviously this was pre pandemic, but they are so into this and what a great way to come into school. So what I had to figure out was well, how do I make this work in a hybrid and remote situation? I do this detective log Monday through Thursday. On Friday, I do this goal sheet. My mentor teacher, when I was at the University of Vermont in 1999 and 2000, did this with all her kids. It was a weekly reflection sheet. Every Friday, she put something out and the kids would fill it in and then it would go home for their parents to see how their week was. Well, I had to figure out how to make all this work in a remote setting. And I'm so glad I was forced to do that because what I have come up with has been amazing. So I made a digital detective log. So every morning, Monday through Thursday, the kids come in. They fill out their last name, their first name, their agent number. Then I, I get so much more data from them every morning. It's an SEL check. How did you sleep last night? Didn't sleep at all to the best night's sleep ever. So now I know how my kids are starting the day. How was your breakfast? I skipped breakfast, best breakfast ever. So this, I know I can send kids who are in school, if they put a one or a two, man, you didn't eat, there's breakfast, free breakfast in the cafeteria, go get it. Um, in general, how are things outside of class? Horrible to one of the best days of my life. And again, they fill this out every four days of the week. And then anything I need to know is optional. These are mandatory. And then I have a question on a morning announcement slide deck that they're looking at while they're filling it out. So now I've put that question in a different slide deck and the kids type their answer right here. So I was still able to keep that question of the day. And what I was able to do, which has been unbelievable, is I don't know how many of you know how to color code in Google Sheets. I Googled how to do it. Like I didn't get a class on this. It's called conditional formatting. It's already in Google Sheets. So when my kids put an answer in, if it's one or two, I've coded it to be a red. If it's three, it's a yellow, like a stoplight. And if it's four or five, it's a different shade of green. Then I can sort it by agent number and then see if there's changes and I need to alert the counselor. So it's been really great check-in four days a week. And the conditional formatting is great. And I got nervous that I was literally gonna have to be coding this Google sheet all year because I mean, we're up to like well over 1500 answers since school started. It just keeps doing it itself. It's thank you, Google. So it's been great for me to see. And then I, it also helps me like one of my kids today had all ones. So obviously, what am I going to do? I'm going to check in with that child. And turns out his parents are mad at him because he is not following directions, not doing his homework and staying up super late. He actually lied and told his parents he had a snow day and they believed him. We did not have a snow day that night. So it just, I could see why he'd be all ones. Then I had to take the goal sheet right here and make something. So what I came up with was just something very simple. Um, I used Slides Mania. I sort of found this template somewhere along the lines. And I took this slide and I said, something that made me feel positive this week, something I learned this week, a high of my week, like the best part of my week, the low of my week, which is the worst part of my week, and something I wish my teacher knew about this week. And I literally copied and pasted and duplicated and made 52 slides, one for each week, even though we have school vacation in summer, but I made plenty. And every Friday, this is what the students fill out for their reflection. And if they don't know something, I tell them to write, I don't know, or if they don't have a high or a low, don't fill it out. If there's nothing they wish I knew, don't worry about it. But this is how I found out that kids' parents were going through a divorce. This is how I found out that one of my kids got locked out of the house. This is how I found out that, you know, one of my kids got a new dog or somebody died or all kinds of things that you wish you knew and don't know about your kids, asking this one question made a huge difference. And when you build that trust in those relationships with kids, they'll start filling this in more and more. Like today, that kid that put all ones, something I wish my teacher knew about this week, he wrote, my parents are mean. <laughs> right? Well, it fits yesterday's ones. So it makes sense. So any questions about the detective log and the goal sheet? Slide deck, I should say. Okay. 
and all just, of this stuff. I just wanted to say this is amazing. Thank, thank you very much for sharing. Something. Oh, you're welcome. Give some, I, give some appreciation out there for you. Thank you. No, anytime. I am a beg, borrow, steal. I am. Look, if any of you are on teachers, pay teachers, more power to you. I'm just a, here it is, take it type of person. That's why I'm in this profession. So yeah. So these, yeah. Hi, this is Marla. Um, yes, this is fantastic. I can already like feel the connection you have with your kids, which is, and I taught fifth grade for 13 years. And that's an age where they're not quite teenagers yet, but they're getting there. So they really need, um, it's a tender age. And it was in the States in a rural area. And yeah, they, the lives are a little bit unstable and they uh, really, I mean, at any age, the connection is important, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a tender age. Um, now this, uh, just quickly, the, the things that you're learning about your, about your students. Now, um, do you go further and contact, the, I know you said like who needs maybe to refer, do you refer them to a counselor if you think it's mm -hmm. needed or would you maybe yep, refer, I refer them, them to, them to a counselor? Directly? Yeah, I refer them to a counselor. I've done like breakout rooms where I put the student in a private meet if they're not in the room to be able to talk to them. Okay. And on a, so this is where it gets tricky, right? I've had, right. I've had to basically beg my tech department for, so I have neuropathy from the chemo. Uh -huh. So I needed um, a touch screen. So they got me a touch screen Chromebook and I took, um, I figured out which look, do I want to go spend money on things? But these, right. Um, the earbuds right. are amazing because are even just regular headphones. Because when I have to talk privately to a student, I can put them on a breakout room and a Chromebook and then use headphones. So that way the rest of the class isn't hearing it. I have a smart board. So oftentimes the meet and the kids are coming out of the speakers and a smart board. So uh -huh. I don't want all of the kids to hear this conversation, right? So if it's something where a kid needs to talk to me, I will meet with them. The other thing I've done is without naming names, I've gone through some of the detective log answers and shared what kids have written there. Mm hmm or if a child, there's a question in the detective log that says, what else do I need to know? If a child asks me a question, like my kids are asking how my weekend was and how my, so I'll answer them, right? I mean, a kid's gonna ask you that, you're gonna answer them. Right, and then as right. far as the goal sheet, the goal slide deck goes, it's in Google Classroom. So I am able every Friday, I sit down during my prep and it literally takes me like 25 minutes just to quickly read them all. I leave a private comment for each child. And part of their morning work, actually, the next morning, if they don't see it, is to check their email. Okay. I try to get my kids to check their email every day. So I might follow up with them in an email. I might follow, follow up with them in a private comment. If something is like huge, I might email a parent to me. One of my kids was talking about two people that died. So I did. I emailed the parent. And I asked. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Marla, did that answer um, your question? Support. Yes, yes, thank you, absolutely, thank you. And the other thing is, is with things like this, the kids know you care. Yes. Right? They know that you wanna to get to know them to the core, right? That you're not just mm -hmm. asking them a question and not reading it, you're not answering it. And the, I actually have, so we're in a hybrid model. So I have 22 total students and I can't make this up. On Mondays and Thursdays, I have 19 kids in my room. So there's yeah. four kids at home. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, there's 10 kids at home. So it's a little bit of a and different. The rest are, yeah, my friend is doing a hybrid classroom. It cannot be easy. <laughs> yeah, and I have daily cohort kids too. But when the kids are in the room, they see me answering this or looking at them. The yeah. other thing I do when the kids come in is I used to shake their hands at the door every morning and say good morning. Well, that went out the window, obviously. Right. So now right. we either, they have a choice. We can air high five, air fist bump, or yeah. air hug. And I say good morning and say their name every day. I think it's so important to say their names. Yes. Acknowledge, yes. Yep. So every morning, that's how we start our day. Wonderful, thank you. And they, you're welcome. And then they go right into this detective log and this goal sheet. Right now, I have yeah. questions. Uh, about the questions to ask, is they an yep. active flock? So you you do it two activities in same day, or like if you alternate the activities each day, or like so this this questions you ask, like if you do the daily like a get a uh, question to ask each day, and with the detective flock, you do it the same two activities. Yep. So they day. do. Yep. So they do this Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. They fill this form out every morning. And what I've come to find out actually is my kids actually 
put all their answers into this before I even open up the meet if they're home. Yeah, okay, great. And then all they're waiting for is what the question of the day is. So when they actually log on, I can show you what that looks like because I have you on my work Google in case people ask. So when the kids log on in the morning, this is what they see, right? Mm -hmm. Like going with the detective theme. And I got this from Slides Mania, which is an amazing thing for you if you need Google Slide templates. But every morning they have this and then I've highlighted the question of the day. So Tuesday's question is gonna be what bugs you? Great. I have it set up for the week already. Share a memory that makes you happy on Monday. So here's what they see in the directions and they fill their detective log out, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. On Friday, they see this and it tells them what slide and that rainbow slide deck to fill out. So Friday, we do that rainbow slide deck. That's the only one that's different. Thank you. Yeah, that's You're great. welcome. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. So the other thing I do is um, I talk about visual learning selfies. I can't take credit for this idea, but I did make it my own. I listen to them. If you're not familiar with her, Caitlin Krause, she's the, she wrote a book called MindWise. She does a lot with mindfulness. But one of the things that she taught me about was we can't see inside our kids' heads, right? Like we, we don't know how they learn. Well, I want to know how my kids learn. So what I used to do before the pandemic was I go through this slideshow where if I was going to look into their brain and see how they learned, what would I see? So I sort of talk about how I learn. And it's not about how you look, it's about how you see. And I, we talk about what that means. And then I want to know, how do you learn? Where do you learn? I want to know their story, but through pictures and symbols. So here are some things that like Caitlin and my students have done. And Caitlin taught middle school and high school and I teach elementary. So these are from Caitlin. And so these are high school kids and middle school kids. Just to kind of give you an idea of what kids were drawing. And so then I taught my students, that's my nephew. And then I talked about getting an Instagram template and then drawing what they do. And here's fifth grader ones. And I put in a link to the paper template we use. Now this year I couldn't do that, right? Like I can't have, I couldn't get the paper to them because they were all at home. So what did we do? We made a shared Google slide deck. And if you've never done a shared Google slide deck, it's awesome because you have all the kids on one slide deck. And if you use Google, one of the things I showed even my own colleagues the other day, and they didn't know you could do this, on the bottom left of the slide sorter is a grid view. I can now see all of my kids working at once. And the nice thing about the slide deck is agent one goes to slide one, agent two goes to slide two, agent three goes to slide three. And we actually teach a lot about digital citizenship through this because you need to be on your own slide. You can't be changing anything. And I often get asked when I talk about this, well, what happens if kids do? I go to the version history and I have a couple of options. I can either copy and paste and put the kids work back or I can change it all back to the beginning and every kid has to start over. And let me tell you, that is the first and last time anybody will mess up anybody else's slide because they don't ever want to lose their work. But look at how the kids all learn. Look at what they put this year. I mean, look at how many YouTubes. I mean, I learned so much from my kids. I mean, you get the humans, which I thought was great that they have not lost my family by putting in my effort, by working hard. So it was nice to see some of these things in here. A lot of Googles, which was really neat. And then what I had the kids do was fill out like an exit ticket. I had them go and observe and see how many things they had in common with their classmates. What did you notice about how our class learns? And then what I had them do in January was go back and look at what they did and see if they wanted to change it. There's so much power in reflection. And then I asked, did you make any changes and why did you make the changes if you made them or why didn't you? Raina? Yeah. Sorry, Marla, again, can I ask, okay. um, I was in a brief workshop last week and the, the presenter was actually talking about exit tickets, just really quick. 
she said, I was just, I was using them wrong. I was kind of just reading them and they were going in the trash. So do you, you reply, she said, I wasn't giving feedback. So do you do feedback to your- ex Yeah, we taught, we taught, I actually showed the kids the, um, I'll sh I can show you actually. So what I do is, is you can show the kids these charts. Wow. <laughs> right? So look at this. 19 kids said that they had five or more things in common, like 19 responses were five or more in common. Now we filled the form out twice, right? So I, each time we did it, we could watch it grow. So it kind of grew exponentially. And then I can share this right here and notice there's no names, right? So there you remove that worry that my teacher's going to show my thoughts or, or what I was thinking. I, said, or yeah. I, I spelled something wrong and I have to be embarrassed. Like nobody knows. Right. But yes. And then look at this, this I, we found interesting only four kids out of the, tw out of the, the group that did this changed everybody else felt like what they put in September was the same and then they're thinking so yes yeah, so you can show don't be afraid to show them the form results and even if you have names at the top you can just slide down real quick and then share it okay all right so that's the any quite more questions about the visual learning selfies okay the other thing I did, which I got nervous and didn't think I could do, if you've ever read Teach Like a Pirate by Dave Burgess, he talks about Play-Doh and the power of Play-Doh with kids. And there's this exercise where the kids actually get to make something about themselves out of Play-Doh. So I asked them to create something so we can learn about themselves and they all got a little canister of Play-Doh. Well, this year I wasn't sure how I was going to do that. Well, I got them all Play-Doh. It's like $12 on Amazon for like a 24 pack. And I gave them each their Play-Doh. And then we learned about, um, if you're not familiar with Wonderopolis, while we were waiting for kids to finish, we read and learned about the history of Play-Doh because kids don't even know where Play-Doh comes from or how it came to be. So it becomes like a little science lesson. And then the kids would present what they made. So we were able to do that this year too. It just, instead of me buying Play-Doh for the class and then putting the Play-Doh back in the cabinet, I gave everybody their own little can of Play-Doh and now they keep the Play-Doh, which has become a great thing for the kids who need the sensory feeling and touching too. So it kind of served two purposes, but you really get to know a lot about the kids just from what they make with the Play-Doh, right? Like here's a Lego, here's a baseball bat. We have a golfer, we have a baker. Somebody likes lacrosse. So you kind of get all into, I like to make robots. And it's and then what's nice is for the kids who are nervous, because you do this at the beginning of school, right? The kids who are nervous about getting up in front of a group, I'll ask the child to tell me what it is and why, and then I'll stand with that child at his, her, their desk and explain what it is for that child until that child's ready to talk in front of everybody. Raina, can I ask? So with yes. the Play-Doh, do you use that just in the beginning of the year or nope. throughout the nope. year? You can do it whenever throughout the year. I started at the beginning of the year, but they make things out of it all the time. Like each week or for certain lessons, you can ask them to use the Play-Doh to... Yep. Yeah, so like right now we're doing the water cycle, right? They could li literally make the water cycle out of Play-Doh on their desk. It's a wonderful idea. Yeah, the hard part with the hybrid model is my kids always don't have Play-Doh at home. And I tell them no matter how many times I tell them their office is their backpack and leave everything in their office. I'm sure many of you, you know few, that things that get left at home or school. But yeah, you could totally have them take it out. So any other questions about the Play-Doh? Okay, this is one of my most favorite finds. So Tara Martin came up with this acronym real, and I really wanted to figure out how to be real with my kids, right? Like, so we talk a lot about, I'm going to show you this video in a second, but we talk a lot about this real acronym and about being real with each other and about speaking from the heart. And I saw this video at a conference I went to about the strategy called the three A's, which Edutopia put on their website. It's called Appreciation, Apology, and an Aha. And I'm hoping if I play it, you'll be able to hear it. 
It's appreciation apology. Can you hear that? Could you hear him? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Or, or aha. Uh -huh. The closing circle activity. Yes. Appreciation apologies and ahas. So the whole purpose is just to have some space to reflect on our day. All I want you to do is to stand around the room somewhere in a circle while we do our brief shout out. People can either identify an appreciation they have, an apology they have, or an aha moment where it's a light bulb moment in their head. My aha was that race is not the only part of our identity. So can we get a few people to shout out an appreciation, apology, or aha? I want to appreciate Jonathan. He helped me like kind of figure out where I wanted to go with my personal statement. I think those types of appreciations or like community recognitions can go a long way to build the bonds. That's the whole point, right? Building community. I apologize for having my headphones in half of the time to everyone. Thanks a lot for that, Carlos. That means a lot. So I show the kids this video and then we talk about what we saw and we reflect on some of the quotes that the kids said in the video and then what it means. And then I'm not sure if any of you have room jobs if you teach the lower elementary, but I actually have a three A's leader at the end of our day and that student runs this and the kids raise their hands in the meet and they have a chance every day at the end of the day to share an appreciation of the day, an aha moment of the day or an apology. And it's just a great way to end the day, tie it together. And one of the things I found was, especially when my, I had some more advanced females, if you will, who would be very catty on social media. And obviously that spills into the classroom, even though they're not supposed to be on social media because they're under 13. Being able to apologize to somebody before you leave school made that whole afternoon for that kid so much easier and a lot less drama too. So it was great. So any questions about the three A's? It's just a great way to end your day. All right, the next thing I wanna show are vision boards that I borrowed from Casey Bell's blog post about creating a vision board about learning and goal setting. And this is something you could do year round as well to build community and kids could add to it. We talk about what a vision board is, about your ideas and things for the future through words and images, about things you wanna do in life, things you wanna learn about, things you wanna be. We talk about what a goal is. Again, we've already done this Twitter goal, so this is kind of a nice springboard for that. We brainstorm goals. We talk about unrealistic goals versus realistic goals. If I have one more kid tell me they're gonna play for the NFL, I'm like, what's your backup plan? You gotta have that backup plan. And then I give them some questions to think about and they have, they do have this slide deck in front of them. So just some good ideas, what gets you up in the morning? What kinds of things do you want to accomplish? What books do you want to read? I have them make a list of 10 or more ideas and a notebook and then star their top five or six. So I model with my brainstorming session about some of the things I want to do which I look at this and a lot of this stuff, like start my research for my dissertation. It is done. Chapter five is already with the advisor. Like there's things here that even I get to talk about with the kids when I look back on this that I'm, I've already done since September. I mean, obviously I'm not going to any concerts lately. And then I tell them to create their vision board and add images, shapes, arrows, emojis. They can be creative. Again, the similar idea of that class slide deck where every student's on the same slide and then they get up, I can put it, the nice thing is, is I can share this. So whether or not we're in the physical classroom, kids can get up and if they're home, they can just read from home. So location isn't a barrier for presenting. And you can kind of get an idea of where your kids are and what they want to be. And then we talk to each child after they present. So when somebody asked earlier about feedback, it's given right in the moment. You know, the kids, other kids and myself can ask questions about what kids want or kids say or do, or we can, you know, compliment them or talk about connections that I've made, like with the Rubik's Cube or the, the game controller. So it just puts me in another level with the students. This one I loved. Um, I'm not sure how many of you know what LuLaRoe is, but it's like a woman's fashion line that's sold through Facebook actually. And this is a male student whose mother, that's her job is a LuLaRoe consultant and he helps her model and hold things up. So he was really proud to tell us that. So I got to tell him that's where all my leggings are from. So here you can see kind of where 
give them an opportunity to shine just by sharing their ideas and images about themselves now and in the future. So any questions about vision boards? I know I'm throwing a lot at you in an hour. Okay. Um, sorry, very quickly, all of these, all of this is created using Google Slides, right? Yeah. So yeah. Okay. But you That's could use PowerPoint. I don't see, like, if you were an Office 365 school, I feel like a lot of this is just the same thing, but in PowerPoint or any kind of, um, even if I'm, if any of you use Seesaw, I'm guessing that you could do it in Seesaw for the, uh, the littles. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're yeah. welcome. So one of the things that I have found when it comes to teaching math is kids immediately shut down right? They automatically think they are bad at math, except for the kids who know they are just good at math because they're good at numbers, right? So I do a lot of talking about mathematical mindset. So I'm actually going to blow this up. So we start with this hyperdoc on mathematical mindsets. And we talk about on a Padlet, I have the kids share what their thinking is about math. So here's what the kids thought about math at the start of the year, just to give you an idea. And this was their first time ever using a Padlet. And it's a great way to get their thoughts. But look, like you have, I don't like it. I don't like it. I like it. I love it. I hate it. I don't love it, but I hate it. So it's just funny to see what they think. I think of pie. So just kind of fun to see. So they do, they talk about that. Then I tell them a story that happened to me in seventh grade, which is the absolute truth. I would, um, in, in the States, they tracked you in math. I don't know if they do that everywhere. So I started in the second highest level of math. And the first day of school, the teacher gave us a math quiz. And I was like, yeah, I'm seventh grade. What are you like 13 years old? I'm like, who's giving me a test on the first day of school? So I just put like, C, C, C. like who cares? I failed it. She moved me down to remedial math. So I went from the second highest class to the lowest math class in my grade just because I failed that quiz on the first day and my parents didn't know enough to advocate for me in the early nineties. So they were just like, oh, the teacher must be right. My kid doesn't know math. And because of that, I was always a year behind all of my classmates in math for the rest of my academic career until I got to high school and fought to take honors classes with kids younger than me. So I tell this story to my kids just so that way they can see kind of a personal thing. And then I show them Joe Bowler's How to Learn Math, which says, talks about the brain and the plasticity and the neurons and all the development and how the synapses grow and how basically there's no such thing as a math person, that you, everybody has the capability to learn math. Then we talk about what they learned, what surprised you, did this change your opinion from the beginning? Then we reflect and talk about some takeaways. Then I talk about you don't need to be a genius. There's this great story about a Chinese migrant worker who had no professional math training that solved some massive math problem that people couldn't figure out. Like, I don't even know how we figured it out. It was like Goodwill Hunt. They call him the modern Goodwill Hunting, if you've ever seen that movie. So we talk about him. And then I have them make a math meme in a shared slide deck. So kids love to make memes and it's literally a picture with text about their math mindset. And it's just, that's how I start math class before we even get into the math program, because I want to know how they want to feel about learning math this year. And we remove sort of that anxiety right away because I'm not diving into you have to multiply or divide. I want to talk about your feelings about math first. And what a great way to build community and, and a math community where Mistakes are embraced and we're going to have fun with this. I mean, look, I'm talking the third day of school or making a meme about math. They look at me like I have 10 heads because who's ever asked them to do that? But we do. So they really enjoy that. And I get into their thinking and feeling. And then I can always go back and say, let's look at your meme. How do you feel about math now? So it's a nice little reflection. So we talk about that. So any questions about mathematical mindsets? Another great way to do that. The other thing you could do, which I just put in here, is if you're familiar with Breakout EDU, it's the lock boxes. I mean, we can't do them right now because the kids can't collaborate, but they're a great way to engage communication and collaboration among kids. And I put in a link here 
to all of these. Um, Matt Miller with Ditch That Textbook has 40 plus free digital escape rooms for kids of various ages that are already made for you. Where the kids have to guess the clues and can work together to figure it out. And you can do them in forms or sites. I mean, I've been playing around with them. If you're fluid with forms and sites, they're actually, I thought they were gonna be super hard, but once I actually sat down and looked at it, it makes sense how people are creating them, but I'd rather just take one that's already made and copy it and then just put in what I need to. But digital escape rooms are another great way. Um, one thing I wanted to share is if you're a Google school or you're not using forms. So I know Office 365 has their own surveys in there. So one of the things I do is I ask kids about book choices. So when I'm doing literature circles, which I'm doing now, I put out the books, then they can choose the books they want to read. And I don't know about you, but when kids used to do it on paper, I'd have like no cards or pieces of paper. And I was trying to group kids by like what book they wanted to read and it took forever. Whereas now the nice thing is, is I can just go through their responses in a Google sheet. And then look, I color coded them. So I knew who got one book pretty quick. So it's just a nice way to ask kids what they want to read. I also encourage kids, I have a huge classroom library that I'm still able to use. So if they want me to buy a book, I have this form. They put the title of the book, the authors of the book, the genre. Why is this a great title missing from our library? Then I ask them to actually go on Amazon and put the link there and how much it costs. Because believe it or not, some of you might not know this, Amazon's prices change depending on where and who is looking at it. So I want to know how much the book is when the kid's looking at it because they'll price match, which is kind of nice. I showed you the um, my detective log that I sort of got the idea from with this daily check-ins from Mary Venturino. So that's just another way that you could do this some very similar. She started that and she's got that for high school, which is great. She actually codes it and averages it. I'm not that fancy, but that's another way. I've used a Google form for collecting kids' work. So when kids are making things, instead of getting having them share 18 million links with you, they actually just paste the link here to their work. And then I get a Google sheet with all their links. So I can just click on it, one, two, three. Another way to use Google Forms is with a hyperform. It's a great way to see what your kids know and make them feel comfortable because you can put video in to remind them of what things are. So if I'm teaching about division, here's a review and reteach, they can watch a brain pop video and some Khan Academies, then they can show what they know and here are some problems that they can solve. And then there's some word problems and then I have them write their own problem and everything's in this one form, which is nice. I've also used Google Forms for math reflections to build my math thinkers capacity and I ask questions like what are the main mathematical concepts or ideas you've learned in class today? What are you struggling with? And I ask them to choose three questions off of this long list. So there's some choice in there. So the kids don't have to feel like they have to answer everything and they can pick the questions that resonate with them. You know, how could you use the ideas from today's lesson to be used in life? And then I, you know, I talk to the kids about them. I might email them about their responses. Just a nice way to build that community. One of my favorite additions is music requests. My kids can be DJs. They put their first and last name in, the title of the song, who sings it? What is, they have to answer at least one of these questions. What does the song mean to you? Why do you think we should listen to the song as a class? How does the song make you feel and why? And then if they have to, if they can find the link to the video on YouTube, and just to give you an idea of what we have, whoop, listened to anything highlighted in yellow i've already played so we've had a bohemian rhapsody from queen i learned about fishy on me from tico didn't know that was a thing but it's a thing um you know and dina menzel lost boy by ruth b and then we get into like elmo and my you know these are things barney song we have things from hamilton um today we I guess there's this new thing called Rick Rolled. You can Rick Roll things with Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up. It must be something on TikTok because when my kids were in the chat going, we just got Rick Rolled. I, I had to Google it to see what that actually meant. And it's a real thing. So I am totally connecting with my kids just by playing things like MC Hammer. 
in a class meet, which has been great. So, you know, asking them about that. I also do a listening center where if you're not familiar, like with, I do with TED Talks and podcasts, but the kids should see this. Is a, if you're not familiar with this, Google this website. It's like videos of awesome things kids should see. And for the listening center, I have them write about like if they're doing a TED Talk or a podcast or this one, like what video or what did you listen to? Why did you choose it? Should kids see it? And then what did it teach for this one? What did it teach you about and why should people watch the video? So that way I know that they actually watched it, right? So just some sort of reflection there. I also have, um, when, when I taught in the real world, when there was no pandemic, I had a bothering box where if kids were bothered, they could fill it out. So they put their last name, their first name and what's bothering you. And this is how, wait, can I see if, oh, I don't know if it will go. Yes, it will. So what I do, it's my favorite thing, is this is how I know when I look at the kids snitching and cutting in the lunch line, these kids are playing games during my read aloud. So all of a sudden my email will go off and the kids just, they can't see it, but they don't know that I got this. And I'll look at it real quick and I'll go, oh, the tech department just emailed me. So-and-so is on a game when I'm doing my read aloud. The kid like face goes white, but the bothering box is great because now I know like who's doing what and I have evidence of it. And then on the flip side, I also have a smilogram box when, or a form now that when you catch somebody doing something good, you can send them a smilogram. And then what I'll do is, is I'll copy and paste this and email it to the child and write who it was from. So then they get a little smilogram, which is kind of nice. And then I also have digital room jobs, which was a lot of fun to do this year. So we have a greeter that greets everybody in the chat in the morning. I have the person who tells me if the kids are there or not in the meet, so they take the attendance. I have a chat master, that person monitors the chat. I, I try to do a gatekeeper, that did not work, where they make sure everybody had a fair turn. It's like the kids did it anyway. I have a direction captain. This person repeats all my directions because I'm done repeating myself 50 times. I have a discussion director who leads discussions, a task master to make sure we're on task. We do a morning meeting. So I have a morning meeting host. So think like Jay Leno in the monologue. So kids are doing like, would you rather questions in the chat or the poll? They're doing fun facts, sharing the weather, like what the day, what the day is like it's national hot dog day. There's a social media ambassadors who can tell me what we should post from the day. The three A's leader, the participation specialist is a great one because then I don't have to worry about whose hands are up in the meet. This person calls on the kids whose hands are up. The question collector, if I miss any questions, this person sort of collects them for me so that way it's there. And then I have them fill out a little job application of what they wanna do and why they should do it in a reference, which was neat. So just the Google Forms and is a great way to build community. It's one of those underrated tools. And then just to end, some few things I have to share is um, I got speech bubble whiteboards at like a random like dollar store. And so having the kids be able to write their thoughts and then take pictures and then we can tweet or put these on Inst our class Instagram if kids have questions. I'm not sure if any of you have ever seen this hashtag positive sign Thursday. There's a group of us all over the world that do it. It's every Thursday we try to fill social media with positive messages and the kids, I actually ask the kids if they, these are taken a couple years ago, but if they want to be in the photo, right? Like I don't just take it. I ask the kids if they want their photo taken. I think that's really important. And I'll never forget one of the first, one of the first times I asked a child that he looked at me and said, even my own mother doesn't ask me that. The kids don't, you know, if they don't want their photo taken that day, then don't do it. So we do Positive Sign Thursday on Twitter. We've done um, Wakelet where we, I used to make um, weekend reviews where I put all my pictures in a Wakelet and then show the kids and send it out in Google Classroom and an announcement so they could see all the great things we were doing. We use Brain Pop as getting to know you, making a movie about the summer, share something new. If your school lets you use Flipgrid, which I need parent permission. So if kids can't use Flipgrid, they can use Screencastify. I had them even before school started introduce themselves to me and their classmates and talk about what they did over the summer or something they learned. I think I had this year. What did you learn from the pandemic that you didn't know about yourself? So that like, you know, I figured out like kids learn to bake and kids learn like how to build things and 
try new things and spent more time outside. So it was a nice way for the kids to get to know each other before school started. I also have um, what I put in here was digital games that kids can play because social emotional needs are so huge. So I don't know if any of you ever played Boggle, but there's an online board. So kids can play Boggle. There's an online categories board if you want your kids to play categories, and then you hit play and the categories come up. So it's just another way to build community. All right, don't tell taboo on me, but there's an online taboo game. So I made a, I took a screenshot of the pictures if you've ever played taboo. So the kids get the word at the top and the, they can't use these words to have the other kids guess their word. So I'll email the card to the child. So that way the other kids don't see their card. But don't tell taboo because I'm probably like massive copyright. But when you're looking for things to do, you like just, you, you got to do what you got to do. Um, we've done Pictionary using Google Keep Drawing Tools, Jamboard, Google Draw. Um, they really like the Jamboard and Google Draw Tools. I mean, uh, the Google Keep Tools, they find them more fluid over the Google Draw Tools. But what I found was when kids were using Google Draw Tools, they put in images with it. So it was kind of a neat thing to do. I made um, this Connect Four game. You can make a copy. Oh, where'd it go? There it goes. But it literally looks like this. I found, I Google searched um, just a picture of the Connect Four board and then literally made a bunch of red and black circles that they can drag. And then if like me and is it Shannon, Grace, I see you on my screen. So if Shannon and I were playing, we'd say, let's go to slide four. So there's like, you know, 30 different boards on the one slide deck. So we would pick a slide and just go and we'd play. You can do the same thing with tic-tac-toe. I made that on a jam board. Will it come out so you can see it? But literally it's a bunch of tic-tac-toe boards and the kids just X and O and can erase, there it goes. So you can see, I literally just took an image and put it on the jam board and then they just fill it in and they can have a partner. And I, you know, I can play with the kids too. So that's just something else. And then there's also, um, I didn't make it, so I didn't put a link in, but there's a chess game floating out there. So you can find all these digital games that the kids can still play, which is nice. And then I know I shared the facing history. And then the one thing I've been doing, oh, that's not right. I'm going to have to fix that link. And I will do that right now because I can know where that is. The one thing we've been doing right now is I don't know if you're familiar with Sylvia Duckworth, but she had this great um, sketch note about learning how to apologize. So I just taught the kids how to apologize which is a massive life skill. I'll switch the link out. But it was inspired by, um, if you've ever listened to Brene Brown's podcast with Harriet Lerner about how to apologize, it was fascinating. So we talked about when you're told to apologize versus when you want to. And then I'm not going to go through the whole slide deck, but we went through these seven things. And then at the end, we talked about what we just finished talking about, what is not an apology. So these are things that kids really need to know. And let me fix that link real quick. And that was what I prepared for you today. And I have references in case anyone wants those as well. Any comments, questions, things you want to know more about? I do want Rina. to thank you for choosing this session. Raina, yeah. thank, thank you so much for all these wonderful ideas. I don't know the rest of participants, but I definitely want to be a grade five in your classroom.